What is on and popping everyone out there in Inside Carolina land? Joey Powell here with another episode of Inside Carolina's Coast to Coast podcast. We are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. Appreciate everybody being here. New episode of the Coast to Coast tonight, and we've got things to talk about. So, as usual, we have with us Sean Moran and Cheryl McMillan joining us live from their respective corners of the world. Uh, we're happy to have them here. And let's just go first things first, fellas. Uh, live action with uh, Hubert Davis, or with, I'm sorry, live action with Carolina basketball was Friday night. I know you guys saw that, but more importantly, we all saw what happened at Chapel Hill Saturday night as the Tar Heels went and uh, won a big football game. And so if you hear Sherelle and I sounding as if we are the uh, fifth and sixth members base and double base of uh, Boys to Men, please understand it's because our voices have absolutely been left at Keenan Football Center. Uh, we were in the stadium and then just kind of discarded our, our voices right there at the, the trash cans, just the outside of the football center. So uh, if we sound a little, a little couple octaves lower than usual, just roll with it, all right? Um, Sherelle, first things first, you were in the building Friday night for live action with Carolina basketball. Uh, I hate to do the, you know, the general your thoughts thing, but what did you feel like walking away from there? What was your overall takeaway, and, and what was the first thing that comes to mind if I say, all right, Sherelle, live action was last night. You say, bleh. So, full transparency, I was not in the building this year for the first time in Forever. Well, you, I, I just ruined the show then. No, right. no you're fine. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, watching from home, I think the first thing, honestly, wasn't really basketball related. It's just that the event is so much different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, it was very much a celebration of the start of the year. And I mean, this is not speaking negatively of anyone in the athletics department or anything, but it feels now more like a, a check the box exercise than it used to be. Um, it's kind of yeah. like, okay, we have to do something for basketball. So let's have the men's and women's teams come out and let's do a little intro and play a little scrimmage and go home. Whereas before it was much more of a, I don't want to say cultural event, but, but almost because, you know, uh, Roy Williams was so into it and he loved to, to see the guys, you know, flustered and uh, frustrated with dance moves and just looking kind of incompetent at something. So it, it's a very different feel from what it was that to me, that's the biggest thing is that the event has uh, changed. So for everyone who says that Hubert Davis is a carbon copy of Roy Williams, that's one proof point that he's not. You know, it, it's one of those things where I think, to your point, it's it very much was a family-friendly event. And it was something where everybody of all ages of the family could enjoy it, you know, had some things to see. And you got to see like a little taste of basketball at the end. This now feels more like a Sean Moran type event where it's just a basketball purist thing. Like if, if they could pick this up and put it in like the palestra somewhere, then I think Sean would absolutely be in his element. Um, Sean, did you get a chance to look at anything from, from Friday night? And um, did you have any major takeaways? Well, one, it was good to see basketball being played at the, at the Dean dome. I think from a event perspective, uh, somebody not, I haven't been, been to one since the early, the early Roy Roy years. It was nice just to fast forward through, an hour and a half on the on the TV and get right to the right to the opening <laughs> tip. Uh, 12, 12 minute halves, I think it was when you know went went pretty quick, so it was an easy easy watch. And then and kind of getting to to rewatch it. Um, you know, I think it was it, it felt a little weird seeing all the all the more of the older transfers um, in, in a Carolina jersey, especially Cormac Ryan, who used to watch him playing against. Um, you know, obviously good from a competition standpoint of how close it was kind of evening the teams out would have loved to have seen uh, certain players mixed with, with certain players at times, but all in all, um, you know, I think there is, I know we'll have some overreactions, but I think there were some good takeaways and at least things to look out for uh, since we've been talking about this for so long, it's at least nice to start to see, you know, everybody moving on the, on the court. Yeah. I want to throw this out there too. You mentioned Cormac Ryan by name. I'm going to throw this out there for everybody who's listening and or watching us. By the way, if you have not yet, please subscribe. Uh, leave us a rating, too. We haven't seen any, seen any ratings here lately, so leave us a good rating. We'd appreciate it. Cormac Ryan, to me, feels like an old-school Carolina basketball player. Like, I feel like, and I don't, I like, no names come to mind, but I feel like if you threw 
a jersey on him from like the late 80s, early 90s, kind of Hubert Davis's era, he would fit right in. Like for some reason, he he feels like one of those players to me. Um, and Sean, you touched on a little bit. We talked about overreactions. I think one of the things that always comes out of the first of anything of any season of any sport is this huge overreaction from from fan from the fan base, fans in general, and, and sometimes even even analysts. So I want to go ahead and lean into the overreaction part of, of, about live action from Friday night. Um, these are again, these are tongue in cheek. These are the types of things that people see, and because it's the first action they've seen, they immediately have all of their stock placed in this one little snippet uh, of a preview. So let's have some fun with some overreactions. Sherelle, give me one big time overreaction from Friday night. Uh, Zayden High is going to start and play 30 <laughs> minutes a game and <laughs> maybe lead Carolina in rebounding and three-point shooting. Now, um, that, that's a, a kind of an exaggeration of the overreaction, but uh, I think he was definitely someone that uh, everyone noticed. Uh, yeah. So that's our reaction. There you go. I, and honestly, I've, I've seen folks online and shout out to Brendan Marks from the, uh, from the athletic. Just, he made the comment that he feels like Zayden high is going to work his way into the rotation. Uh, just from that. And, and, and I'm not taking it from, from Friday night. You could say that from Friday night, but also Sherelle, we've, we've heard people around the program, both inside and close to uh, UNC basketball kind of say that they've been surprised with Zayden Hyde. You see any way that he, uh, that he gets more than four or five minutes a game. And honestly, I think five minutes a game is probably a lot. Yeah. You know, I go back to, do we know what Hubert Davis's stance on his bench is? I think, again, that is really the larger question that's coloring everything that people are talking about as it relates to minutes, as it relates sure. to um, rotations and everything. Uh, you know, if, if he comes out and says, you know, he really wants to be loose and he wants to play 10 or 11 guys, then yeah, I, I think high will. But if it's kind of uh, close to what it's been, then I, I still don't think he's ready for that. You know, um, what I look for in events like late night and, and these early season practices and everything uh, isn't really necessarily the results, but like the things that you um, know aren't going to change. Like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, like uh, Elliot Kiddo is not, yeah, oh, well, Eli, like Elliot Kiddo is not going to forget how to pass between now and when the season starts. So right. if you can show that, like, okay, he, he's a passer, we know that. Like, Zayn High's motor is not going to change between now and when the season starts. So that show, you know, his motor showed against college players. We've seen that. So we know. He can do it against college players. His athleticism isn't going to change, mm -hmm. you know, between now and when the season starts. So those things kind of confirm that, yes, he's athletic enough to play college basketball and his motor runs high so that he should be able to, if he's in the game, play hard and, and grab a rebound or two. So I, I think it just confirms those small things, but I think it's hard to extrapolate anything else, you know, outside of that. Yeah. One of the things we always use in the I see live pregame show for football, and by the way, Love everybody coming by and saying hi in the Bulls lot. Um, it's just really cool to talk to people who have been on Inside Carolina for so long. Met a guy uh, Saturday who's been an Inside Carolina subscriber since 06. He shows me his phone and his profile. He has 22 posts on the message board <laughs> since 2006. And I'm thinking, man, I don't know what those 22 posts were about, but they must have absolutely been some <laughs> kerosene-type moments for you. Uh, but anyway, just shout out everybody who comes by and says hey to, to me and Tommy and John Siegley and and everybody who's who's a part of that show, it's just really fun meeting everybody, both basketball and football fans. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you the same thing. Um, and I think I totally sidetracked myself there on the thought I was trying to get to, but we'll figure it out. Um, Sean, I want to ask you the same thing. Give me an overreaction from Friday. Well, before I, I give you that, just saying on on Zayden High, um, you know, I, I think we have talked about him being out of the rotation, but in terms of things that we know he's going to be good at offensive rebounding, I think is the one thing that we've, we've always come back to. Uh, and that was something um, easily you, you could see easily during the AU, AU um, play of last year where he would mm -hmm. attack, he would attack the glass if, you know, even if he spent a lot of time outside the three point line, but he would, you know, he would attack the glass. If he was outside the three point line if he was by the basket. So I think, I know UNC historically has been a team that has liked to crash and sometimes that is pushed based on a system, but you also have to have guys like Armando and Zayden that just have that natural inclination of, of crashing the glass. So I think, you know, that's, as we talked about this summer, what's going to get him on the court and, and that, that along with just being in the right place, you know, him cutting to the basket, mm -hmm. same time RJ is going, you know, going to the lane for easy dunk, like things like that. Um, so 
we'll be interested to see. I also think from a body perspective, he looked a, a little more toned. Um, he was able to get up and down a little easier. He did get body by Armando in the post, but I'd say most <laughs> most true freshmen, that's probably going to be the case for anyway. So I, I think, you know, depending on who the five would be in the game, I think I've always got more five four, but I, I, I think four, you know, four five for him, uh, for the for this team, we could see him on the court. In terms of overreaction, uh, I guess you can you might as well talk Elliot Godot in terms of being the player player of the year. Uh, in terms of <laughs> in terms a boy, what a swing for how, the fence, John. How he played, uh, but I, I think that 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 is a, a a bit of a reach to say the least. But I think um, I think the hype is is justified. We've talked about it so much since the the springtime, and I think there's just something special uh, with him. Uh, I, I know going around and maybe we can u- use this term as we go forward, but Steve Smith calling uh, Jerry Judy a, a jag in terms of just, just a guy. A guy. Just um, a guy. That definitely doesn't fit Elliot Cadeau and just, you know, h- how he dribbles the ball in terms of that, that hard dribble, the quick crossover, even that first little uh, pull up, pull up from the corner free throw line. Not saying their playing styles resemble each other. And I know passing, we've always talked to Kendall Marshall, but a lot of the movement, Reminded me of Raymond Felton yes. of sorts, just in terms of that, that, you know, quick, quick cross and then the ability to pull up at times. Um, he doesn't have quite that hunch that Raymond had. Yeah. You know, Raymond's hunch when he always had the ball in his hand, he had like, he's like 45, his upper body was like at 45 degrees. But now I, I can see that. But I think, you know, when he, when he drove right in the first half and, and got a step and, and just dished it easily off to Armando for a dunk, you know, that was, that was nice to see. Uh, you know, I think the three point shooting, well, that's that's going to be the biggest question. He showed he could he could knock them down towards the end, especially that that last one. I think was a, a confidence one where he had that got the defender um, you know on his heels and just just rose up with a lot of confidence uh, to hit two in a row. But I, you still saw you know if Satan High was on him or somebody else switched, sometimes they would play off a little bit. So I think once again that's going to be a, a big factor as we go. Uh, but I think he's going to make everybody around him better, and at least from the outside looking in seemed to have just a great on-court personality and, and able to fit ability to fit in with the guys. Cause I think it's really going to come down to that chemistry between RJ and, and Cadeau. I think that's actually a really strong point in a sense that his chemistry and kind of how, how he fits and Sherelle, I'm gonna come back to you here in a second, but I'm also intrigued to see, and I don't think this, this necessarily applies to anybody who listens to or watches this podcast, but it's going to be really funny to see, like the fan, the casual fan who sees Elliot Cadeau for the first time and is just freaking out about how advanced he is and just like has this, holy cow, where'd they find this kid? And we've been talking about him since well before he reclassed. Uh, but I think that's going to be fun to watch are the folks that that just see Carolina basketball for the first time and see Elliot Cadeau for the first time and haven't seen any of his any of his tape, any of his film, any any of the, the previews that we've talked about for the last better part of a year. Sherelle, go ahead, man. You know, before I go to that, to your point, like we're recruiting guys, but I almost miss the days when it would become October and be like, "Oh, who's on the Carolina team this year?" Yeah, like, <laughs> not I, anymore. I almost, I almost missed that, and now it's at the point where like we've been watching them for four or five years and like know every intricate detail about their game and everything. So they're not going to show um, us anything new. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to to that point though, one thing with Cadeau that surprised me, we've seen him so many times and. That was not quite as as aggressive offensively as I've ever seen him, but it was close. Um, so I was a little was a little surprised by that. Like he was trying to get to the rim, he was trying to score. I, I don't know if that's something that they've told him to do early on in practice, or if he just felt like that's what his particular team needed that night. But I, I thought that was interesting because um, we've been talking the whole time for the last pretty much year. Yeah, uh, amazing passer, you know, phenom passer, prodigy passer. Uh, but I think we forget that he does have the ability to score. Now, it's obviously going to be different. There were people who were guarding him at times who wouldn't be playing in a normal game. Uh, but I do think he, again, you, you look for stuff that's repeatable, um, stuff that, um, you know, he, he can do over and over again, repeatable. And I, I think he showed some of that stuff. doesn't matter who who's guarding him. Like he said, the, the pull-up three, full of confidence. Um, and then we know the passing is going to be there. So. Uh, I, I do think that is a, a takeaway is that when he is aggressive offensively, he he can score. Uh, we've seen it before. We thought it would be a little more uh, mooted early on, but he's going for it. 
Uh, I, this is why I love working with you, dude. You actually you actually made me remember what I was going to say earlier. When you talk about things that that are repeatable, we say it on the phone on the pregame show for football. When Tommy and I are talking about do do these things travel right? Like do does X skill set or does X player does X mindset travel? You know, and and go from game to game. And I think that's kind of what you're hitting at with 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 what things are repeatable amongst this team. Um, I want to ask a little bit about. Uh, kind of some old and some new uh, from late night. You know, I know late night, a live action. I know Sherelle already talked about the fact that it's very much um, kind of pared down to just ball. Um, but I want to ask you guys specifically from a team perspective, and Sean, I'll come to you first. Um, tell me, help me understand uh, what what you saw that you felt like was old. You know, it's n- not just the, the ages of the players on the roster, because this is a really old team. But tell me what you think you saw that looks – maybe like a refined or, or, or an improved old tenant from, from the team last year? Well, I think improved. Um, we have talked about a lot. We'll continue to talk about it was, was ball, ball movement. And I don't want to get too far ahead because I think last year, the first exhibition of the ball movement looked pretty good in, in that game. And, and then we, we certainly saw once the season began that that wasn't the case at all. Uh, but I think with the, that, that was a big issue coming out of the team last year. You can look at the assist to field goals made. Um, that's a big, a big talking point throughout the, the season in terms of adding higher IQ basketball players, um, you know, guys that have something to prove, but know how to play within the team system. And I think, uh, you know, my, my favorite moment of the game was RJ pushing it up, uh, but then using, you know, one to two dribbles and using the pass to hit, Harrison Ingram, top of the key, or maybe to a little to the, the left wing, and he swung it quickly to Cormac Ryan for a three in the corner. Uh, I'm not expecting that to be every position, but that was something uh, that I, I really like to see, especially I was pretty critical of RJ leading transition last year um, in terms of over dribbling. Rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. Yep, yep. <laughs> in terms of over dribbling and, and not passing. Uh, so I, I think, you know, if there is that trust, uh, and the ability to utilize everybody's skill set, I think that would be, you know, something you're used to seeing Carolina, you know, Carolina basketball. And once again, that's hard integrating a lot of new people, especially ones that have played in different systems for multiple years. Um, but I think this team is not going to beat you on athleticism. Uh, so this team has to beat you uh, being smart and using each other's strengths uh, you know, to pick people apart. Sure. I'll same question. What was, what did you see from Friday that you felt like, Oh, this feels like either classic Carolina ball, or this feels like, you know, something that we've expected to see out of Carolina. And then it's, it's almost like your binky, right? Like it's, it's what you're falling back on to, to make you calm and feel good about the squad. Oh, it was, uh, really in the first, maybe five minutes. Uh, it was Elliot, Elliot Cadeau was part of it. Uh, drives, right. Gets by his defender. Looks like he's kind of out of the play. Makes a kind of wrap around pass to Armando Baycott for easy dunk. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's something that's just been missing from UNC for the last four or five years. Uh, really post the Pinson, I would say. And um, it was it was just interesting to to see it because it happened so quickly, and you could kind of see him setting it up. Uh, from from I went back and watched it. You could see him setting it up from the time he he started his crossover dribble, and and that mm-hmm. goes back to the point that he's always thinking a, a couple of steps ahead. So um, that's that's kind of what Carolina basketball is. And, you know, it was good to see it again. And you can kind of file this in the in a little bit of the overreaction category for me. And that type of thing looks effortless from him. We saw that when he was playing in high school in a little bit. But now that he's already plugged in with, with this roster that he'll be playing with now at UNC, that specific play, I think, was a perfect encapsulation of how you would dream he would integrate himself with this team because that looked like an effortless play. You know, you've got a veteran in Baycott rolling behind him, uh, and then you've got, you know, like you said, Cadeau making that move to his right, uh, drawing the defense with him and moving the assigned players to him, and then hitting Mondo for the for the dunk. So uh, I, I love that you guys both mentioned that. Uh, Sherelle, stay here. What's something new that you saw? And, and again, like, let's get away from the superficial stuff and just say, you know, new guys in UNC jerseys, but what was something new that you saw a uh, Friday night that, that you think people would be excited about? Uh, so me and Ben Sharman, editor in chief of South Carolina, we always kind of brief uh, after these kind of things. And uh, 
he called. He was like, Cormac Ryan ball handling, huh? Or, or something like that. And I was like, yeah, there was a move probably 10 minutes into the game. Um, he catches on the right wing, takes a couple of dribbles. And he's at the rim, you know, in, in two or three steps. And it reminded me, you know, he worked out with uh, Priority Sports. This is the agency that he, that he worked out with during his pre-NBA uh, stuff. And they used to post highlights. And, of course, being the nerds that we are, I would watch the Priority uh, Sports <laughs> workouts and everything. And it was it was a move that I, he probably has done 400 or 500 times, just muscle memory, that I remember seeing from those workouts that he incorporated into the game. So I think his ability to handle the ball is something that, uh, something new and, and maybe something that um, can aid Carolina that we we might not have thought of. Like we've, we we know that RJ Davis can handle the ball. We know that Elliot Cadeau can handle the ball. We know that Harrison Ingram has some point forward qualities. But I think Ryan as a distributor is something that we haven't talked about a lot. And uh, Ryan as somebody taking guys off the dribble is something we haven't talked about a lot. It's mainly been shooter, shooter, shooter. But if he can do that, then again, that helps with the ball movement. It starts whipping around and you get more open shots. So I, I thought that was something new uh, that could help Carolina a lot. And it just goes to show you that you can't teach a really, really old dog new tricks. I mean, it's something that he, again, you mentioned he worked out in his, in his, uh, his off season with priority. And now all of a sudden he's, he's not repping that. Uh, he's not repping that for the first time at live action, right? Like this has been something that he's done uh, not just since his workouts of priority, but you know, in, in pickup, and obviously, obviously, that's a new word. Obviously, mm -hmm. probably, obviously, in practice with the team. Sean, same question, man. What did you see that you felt like was new? Well, I think in terms of new is is Harrison Ingram's skill set. Skill set. Um, We're I, stepping I think, all over ourselves, bro. It's it's early season <laughs> rust. We're gonna work through it. It's okay. I think we've we've had guys his size that can pass. Theo Pinson being one of them. Maybe not, you know, to the weight perspective, but um, I think one of the first possessions he got the ball from the top of the key drove in had somebody shorter on him and you know put his back to him and and one two dribbles kind of a mid-range post up i'm i'm curious you know that, that i think that's that's new um and i think putting his skill set i think is going to be a big question mark of how do you especially when you're talking about ball movement because i think sometimes what he does best um the ball kind of stops or slows but at the same time um, if you can utilize that size effectively, and if you have people relocating around the perimeter or cutting, I, I think that's going to be something new that you can, UNC can can utilize um, pretty well. But at the same time, you know there was a possession where Armando caught the ball, was was backing down his defender, and everybody just really stood stood around the perimeter, uh, not making themselves available for for open looks. So I think. Harrison Ingram's uh, skill set will be will be one to watch and something new for for Carolina's offense. How about if I split the difference and and share something that I saw that that was was maybe what is old is new again? I saw some secondary break, and Shrill and I talked this a little bit on uh, a little bit on Saturday, but I think North Carolina now has the horses to where some secondary break actually makes sense for this group. Uh, Sean, did you notice that, and was it something that really kind of jumped off the screen to you? De then, man, that was going to be a hot take because apparently his his Wi Fi just wasn't prepared for it. Sherelle, same question. I'll ask you. Uh, did Did you see some secondary and and was it something that that kind of you you maybe you felt like, oh hey, I remember this. And and then I'm like you said, we're early in the season. Wisp, yeah, man, we were so rusty. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And we we had heard that. I mean, Hubert Davis said it publicly that he he wants. Some of that to come back. I think R.J. Davis or Armando Baycott said it. Um, so uh, it was a, there was a little bit there. I, I'm not I'm not getting my hopes up too much because um, again, it's it's one thing to say you're going to do something in October and then put it into action game after game after game. That's yeah. hard. That's 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 uh, how I would say teams who are successful is because they do the same things every single game, and people think that's the easy way to do things. That's the hard way to do things because um, as teams change and situations change, uh, you you want to adjust. You want to do something different. But to stick to your guns and, and play your game is, is very difficult. So I would say, yes, saw some secondary break, but um, I, I'm not sold that it's going to be, uh, you know, top of the scattering report for other teams for UNC this season. We'll, we'll, we'll see. 
Sean, I know you were getting ready to drop some just 100% pure fire and, and just your modem was not prepared for it. Do you want to, do you want to follow up? Yeah. Well, my, my modem, what I was about to say was I was hoping, uh, UNC was going to play a little, little faster. Um, so similar to my modem um, and Wi-Fi speed was going a little slow. I, I know they were pushing the ball, uh, but I, I also know Hubert wanted to, to play faster um, than they, they have in the past. And that was something I know that'll take, take some time, uh, but I would love to see Carolina get, especially with now some of the passing uh, ability that they do, that they do possess. I would like to see that, you know, some easy, easy baskets being incorporated into each game, uh, which, which really hasn't been the case uh, or was not the case last year. They've absolutely got enough trigger men to, to keep that ball from sticking and to keep things moving around. Uh, Sean, when you, your uh, connection dropped out there for a second, I was fairly certain that you had gone to Johnny t-shirt.com and just kind of bailed on the show for a minute. Um, because I know, you know, your little man's growing. And if you're going to get new Tar Heel gear for that for for that kid, where are you getting it? Oh, well, got it. Got to go to Johnny T-shirt. He's a eight month old looking for some eighteen month month clothing. Um, we ran into some Carolina fans uh, outside one of the local bars during halftime, and they're asking where was this Carolina gear. So we got to we got to make sure that he's always uh, representing out here. Well, Sounds we like know you that a left tackle in your future, there, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> we know that John, that regardless of his size or position that johnny t-shirt can take care of him and and sean i'm going to guess that you can probably get the uh in, inside carolina premium subscribers 10 percent discount uh and add that to it which folks can find on the premium message boards uh 10 off of johnny t-shirts amazing uh increased stock and amazing selection of gear uh it, it's hoop season i know that as folks came to town last week and there was a bunch of you at at Keenan Stadium Saturday. I know a lot of people were were there for the whole weekend to see, you know, live action and then uh, see the other sports, including football that were in town this weekend. Hope you stopped by Johnny T-Shirt. If you didn't, maybe you realize you need some new gear, go to johnnytshirt.com. Let them take care of you. Use the premium code that you can find to get that extra 10% off if you're a premium subscriber. If you're not a premium subscriber, I mean, Johnny T-Shirt is still going to take care of you, but you're, you're, you're leaving money on the table. And that just doesn't seem really smart. Uh, take a quick break. Let the national guys run some advertisements in here. Uh, we'll be right back to talk a little bit about some of the guys that were on campus for live action. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the um, the Wooten 150 and get an Ian Jackson update. You're listening to the Coast to Coast podcast here with InsideCarolina.com. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I'm Joey Powell, Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran, the Coast to Coast podcast here. We've actually had organized basketball that people got to spectate. And, and see what was going on. Um, so we talked a little bit about live action with, with Carolina basketball. We went through some of the the old and the new, new, the overreactions, all that kind of stuff. There's some other things that, that come along with uh, with live action, and that's usually there are some, some visits. And Sherelle, you've talked about this in the past. The patterns of who shows up for this event are typically you know pretty, pretty obvious. And, and so I want you to kind of rehash who was in town uh, for live action from the recruiting standpoint. Yeah, so Carolina had four uh, four folks on campus on Friday for live action. Two were official visitors and two were unofficial visitors. Uh, so the unofficial visitors, the first one was uh, Rivers Knight. He is a forward from Combine Academy in Lincolnton, but he's from Durham. Uh, so he drove up from Combine, met his parents, and went to live action. Again, he's 2026, 20, so a younger a younger kid. Um, not not a lot happening from a UNC. Uh, standpoint in his recruitment still very young very early uh so they're trying to you know just have him on campus and, and see what happens uh jackson keith 2025 uh we'll call him a guard slash wing slash forward a basketball player joey 2025 basketball player jordan keith was uh jackson keith was on campus um southern durham high school uh six five six six a really good score uh, this is his second trip to campus in the last five, six weeks, and he also uh, unofficially visited last year. So uh, because of his proximity to Chapel Hill, he's, he's taking advantage of it, been three times uh, in the last year. And he's not received a UNC offer, uh, but I would say, you know, he, he's someone that they're monitoring closely. You, you don't invite someone in that class uh, with, with his ability multiple times unless you're really serious about his, his recruitment. Um, 
of course, some would say, how serious can you be about a recruitment if you haven't offered, which is uh, a very, you know, uh, defensible position. So we'll, we'll see what happens with him moving forward. And then UNC hosted two of its three 2024 commitments. Uh, those commitments will be signees next month when they sign uh, James Brown and Drake Powell. Obviously, Drake Powell is right down the street, but uh, I think it's his visit number six of the fall for him. Um, so he's really taking advantage of that location and just being on campus as much as possible. Uh, this is Brown's second official visit to UNC. Now, the rule changed uh, over this last year, uh, but the two, 2024 guys were grandfathered into the old rule where you could take multiple official visits to one school. So that's how Brown was able to come this weekend. As it stands now, um, players are not allowed to take more than one official visit to a school, like, ever. So they can take as many as they want to as many different schools, but only one to each individual school. Uh, and talk to the, talk to Brown earlier. Um, we'll, we'll have something more in depth later in the week. But uh, said he was having the time of his life. Uh, was was watching on the live feed, uh, talking to his dad. They they really enjoyed it. And then uh, saw him at the game. They were just they're just happy to be on campus. Happy to be around. Same thing with Drake Powell. Um, happy to be around. Happy to be on campus lifelong Tar Heel. So um, a good weekend, a good time to get back. And they got to see live action, a practice, and they got to meet a rapper too. So uh, I, I think I was, it, it was everything. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you could give us a recruiting profile on Jacques Berman Webster II, uh, also That's known not his as... His name. That is absolutely his real name. Also his known name as Travis... Jacques, Jacques Webster? Jacques Berman Webster II. Oh, that's rich. I would have yeah. gone with Travis Scott too. Yeah, um, I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cactus Jack, Travis Scott, whatever you want to call him, don't call him late for basketball practice, was uh, indeed on the on campus this weekend. So I'm sure that was a nice little addition for for anybody who happened to be around. I know uh, I know one Armando Baycott's a big fan to the tune of having a cactus tattoo on his arm. Um, news for you, if anybody knew that. Uh, Sean, do you have a, a profile on, cac on uh, Cactus Jack or Travis Scott's game for us? <laughs> um, I do not, but... Uh, from the message boards, I was, uh, my friends quizzed me to see if I could name any songs. And thanks to having read the message boards, <laughs> I was able to, able to do that. So not uh, a boy. check, check one for the message boards. Not a way to step up. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Sean, I'll throw you the last question that I had for the for the show this evening, uh, run of the show anyway. Uh, Ian Jackson seemed like he showed out at the Wooten 150. Did you, uh, did you catch any of the commentary or, or see any video or footage of, of, of his week there? I think he uh, he showed out at the beginning, and then I I think uh, I think it was a more of a precautionary injury because I, I heard he didn't didn't finish the the camp out. But it seemed like uh, the first night and, and first little bit uh, with Eric Bossy's updates, you know, I, I woke up to a text saying he's playing at a different level than than anybody. Which I I think going back to last week when we we're talking about the recruits, um, you know, he's ranked number ten right now in the class, and I think a lot of that is just that he has been seen for so long and people trying to project, um, you know, five years into the future versus maybe one or two um, or really what he can do at, at the college level. And I, I still think most likely he's going to be ranked higher than that. He should be at top five, I think top, top three to be, to be honest. Um, and I think in terms of the skill set he brings to UNC is going to be a skill set that, UNC hasn't seen from a freshman in, in quite some time, just his uh, the position and his ability to score the ball naturally. Um, so it wasn't surprising to hear everything coming out about him. I think he's continued to to get better. Uh, you know, when he, when he was after his freshman year, played on the USA basketball team, and it was his his three point shot that needed some work. Uh, he's been able to to do that a lot, and I think he's just a guy that can is a natural scorer and can do that in in a lot of ways. So. Excited to see him, you know, now on the, the overtime elite circuit. Um, some similar teammates to his high school, but new new league and seeing how he does. But in, in terms of just being offensively gifted, uh, that that's definitely Ian Jackson, and not surprised at at what uh, Bossy was was saying about him early on. Yeah, for sure. Um, Trill, I, I, I got I got I got Jelly Fam. I don't I don't know what what, what are <laughs> we doing here. That's his team's name. Is is Jelly Fam? Uh, Stop. So Stop. No, that's so, made, you so, made that up. So what OTE does is they kind of rebrand 
the high schools with different names so they can be more in more more hip yeah and so there's a group of guys from New so, Jersey, that, so that New they York can area. absolutely so that they're not uh so they're not chuggy and so they can be uh so they can actually be like no cap and not be sus yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um uh, so there's a group of guys probably like 2014 2015 around there that started this thing called jelly fam with like like finger rolls and there's a whole backstory behind it uh and so the jelly fam is back and our savior lutheran will compete <laughs> in ote as jelly fam oh all right i'm gonna have to make that in the show notes so that folks can know what jelly fam is no there you go. uh thank you for schooling me sir i appreciate that I, I i can't imagine what brain cells just got replaced with that information but i'm glad that i have that now in my cognitive repository uh fellas last part of the show and this segment of the show is brought to you by Congruity, where you guys give your two cents before we we wrap up for the evening. Uh, as you all know, Congruity are, are our great friends, new sponsors, as of about a month ago to Inside Carolina. Um, national brand, but local service. These guys are great. They're your answer to any HR or benefits question that you might have for your business. Be sure to check them out. Um, they're going to save you some money. They're going to allow you to focus on your business. And if you let them, They'll give you a free assessment of how they can help you. And that means they're going to tell you how they might be able to save you some money, how they can affect your bottom line. Um, if you will go to uh, go to their website, check it out, use the code that we've been given out. I don't have it in front of me. So forgive me. I think it's forward slash uh, Carolina. Um, but forgive me. I'll pull, pull it up in, in just one second. Hang on. It's, it's slash Tar Heels. Slash Tar Heels. There we go. So it's congruity.com forward slash Tar Heels. Again, this might be the bumpiest show that we've done in forever, so I appreciate everybody sticking around for us. And thank you for Congruity for understanding that, man, we are pulling it together here, but we appreciate what you see me doing right now, which is bumbling and stumbling all around. That's the opposite of what Congruity is going to do to help your business, right? Go to congruity.com forward slash Tar Heels. Uh, and, you know, you make a great point, Cheryl. I think Congruity could probably optimize this podcast right now. They could probably save us from some of the the running around that we're doing so that we can focus on doing a good show. Uh, God willing, I will reach out to those folks this week. Congruity, check them out. We appreciate their support. Sean, give me your two cents before we go home for the evening. All right. Two cents. First one, going back to, to live action. Uh, we, you know, didn't really talk Armando Bacot at all. Uh, preseason player of the year in the ACC. Most, most likely, uh, not, you know, I thought he looked just physically the, the bounce was there. The, um, just looked looked healthy, which I, I know was a, a big question last year. Uh, but if he can hit that uh, that little 15, 12, 15 foot yep. jump shot, if he could, once again, it doesn't have to be three to four times, but if, if he could feel confident knocking that down, I think that would be that huge addition that we've been talking about all summer. And and I know we've seen it a lot before, but when he caught it on the uh, the right block, quick spin move, right hook, you know, just, you know, we just want to keep keep seeing that. That would be be fantastic. Um, and then on the, the flip side, Jalen Withers, I think probably that was an overreaction um, in terms of how he played. I, I was a little concerned of where, you know, his, his shot was off, but it, was, it seemed significantly off. Uh, so I'm hoping that was just, you know, just getting the, the jitters out of playing at a big time basketball program. Uh, and hopefully that can, you know, he can get, get into that, uh, High thirties, low forty percent three point three point shooter that um, hopefully can be expected. And then number two, I know everybody loves it when people talk about their fantasy football program, but um, doing one with a fourteen team inside Carolina group. And my team's one and four, but it's on the on the rise. So everybody that is in the league, please watch out. <laughs> I, I can't believe you just did that to not only the show but to our great friends in congruity. Like that that might be the that is the optim the the opposite of optimizing uh our lives but you just gave us a bunch of wasted time and energy with your your fantasy football updates inside carolina though so i just i i, I award you no points and may god have mercy on your soul Cheryl mcmillan give me two cents before we go home uh kind of I swear one to god sense. if it's a fantasy football update i'm going to it's, rip my eyes out on the screen it's 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 not. We can talk to Tess Walker if you want. Uh, no, so <laughs> it's one big penny. It's uh, Ken Palm is updated for the 2024 season. Now, a lot of us, we don't treat it quite as our Bible, but more like a sacred text 
and uh, a lot of uh, useful information. I think two things that stuck out to me. Again, I don't, I can't tell you how he does the preseason stuff with new players on new teams and new information, and with the way the portal has impacted everything. I have no idea what the formula is, but uh, the formula spits out that Carolina should be at seventy-two point five possessions uh, per game, which would be the highest since that vintage 2019 team with Kobe White, uh, Cam Johnson, etc. So whatever formula he uses is expecting UNC to play about four possessions uh, faster per game than it did last year. So that's one. And then two, uh, a lot of toss-up games uh, in this projected uh, you know, schedule and record and everything. He has Carolina, the formula has Carolina finishing 21 and eight overall and 14 and six in the ACC. Um, it has Carolina playing Tennessee as a top 10 team, Connecticut, a top 10 team and Duke, a top 10 team. It actually has Kentucky ranked below UNC. who's number 17 in this and Kentucky's number 18. So, uh, looks like a, just a very competitive schedule and, uh, we'll try to dig into these numbers some more, but I, I always look forward to Kim Palm refreshing and just kind of seeing what it says. It'd be really interesting to see how they treat uh unc with a 21 and 8 record that's what you said right 21 and 8 i mean 21 and 8 depending on what those 21 are man that's a that's a, that feels like we're going right back to where we were last year right because there, there's a lot of 105 and and 109 and 128 you know ranked teams on the schedule 118 oh. 105 because they're not expecting syracuse <laughs> louisville boston college Jesus. uh notre dame all those are in the in the lower 100 so those would be q2 wins at best i'm so thrilled for cal and smu to join the acc to, to really bolster uh the conference's uh strength of schedule rankings all right we got to get out of here because between sean's fantasy football comment and and me thinking about what smu and cal will do to, to to unc's rankings i think i just got a little sour stomach boys i appreciate it as always i love that you guys make time for our listeners and viewers on your weekends to bring that uh that goodness that they they seek and have come to know inside carolina for um, Sherelle McMillan for Sean Moran. Shout out to John Stigley for producing. Uh, we appreciate Johnny T-shirt sponsorship as well as Congruity sponsorship. They both are, are great businesses. We hope that you'll uh, show them some of your love and, and give them some business if you are so in the market. And until next time, we'll talk to you here on the Coast to Coast podcast on InsideCarolina.com. Late.